Hello, everybody. Dr. Joe here on this Wednesday evening. I hope you're doing well wherever you're tuning in from. And uh, it's getting a little chilly here in the Washington, D.C. area, but it's going to be supposed to be a nice day tomorrow. And, uh, and so on. Today, we're going to talk about mindset shift and from spender to what I call investor. And there is a big difference between a spender and a investor. And that's what we're going to focus on today is talk about the two difference. And uh, and the reason why I got into this topic today is because uh, I was doing, you know, uh, doing some shopping and uh, and then went to uh, a mall. It was just amazing. People just spending money like there's no tomorrow. And um, and uh, and again, I have no there's nothing wrong. Oops, let's, let's start again. There's just one second. Yeah, so there's, I mean, there's nothing wrong with spending money. I mean, who doesn't like to spend money? Uh, but I think that if you're an investor, uh, you know, you can't continue to do that indefinitely because at some point you're going to have to, um, you know, save some money so you can, you can invest. And so, therefore, I thought it was, a, you know, in this season of giving and in the, um, you know, as we go to the holiday season, I thought that uh, it's good just to kind of talk about this subject. And hopefully you're an investor and hopefully you are thinking long term and hopefully you're trying to buy assets and hopefully you're trying to grow those assets. So hopefully it'll generate you cash flow and hopefully it'll, um, you know, generate you wealth and uh, hopefully generational wealth. But that's not going to happen if all you do is spend all your money that you got. And uh, and so really. You know, it it does require a mindset shift. And I was just talking to uh, somebody else, in fact, today, and they were just saying how if you go to some of these apartment buildings, where you know the assumption is that most people in the apartment buildings are renting, and you got these beautiful cars out outside and uh, fancy this, fancy that, doodads, as the you know, what's it, Robert Kiyosaki calls it, and uh, but they're renting again. There's nothing wrong with renting. But I'm thinking that maybe instead of spending all that money on beautiful cars, maybe they could have set aside some of that money as down payments for a house or for a, a condo. And uh, hopefully they'll be owning it. And hopefully it'll increase in value over time and uh, and so on. So, again, the, I'm not critiquing this. You know, I'm, you know, everyone does their own thing. It's fine. Uh, but it's just a, a, a thought that uh, two people can earn the same amount of money from their job. And fast forward five, 10 years from now, and the outcomes are completely different in terms of uh, what they have to show for it, in terms of their net worth, in terms of their assets, in terms of cash flow, uh, in terms of residual income, and so on. It's just completely different. And, and so I think it's a very timely uh, topic. So again, as usual, we're going to have a Q&A session towards the end. So if you've got some questions, please put it in the chat box, and I'll definitely try to get to them. Uh, later on. So let's get going then. Understanding the investor mindset. And uh, the question is, what differentiates the investor mindset from a spender's mindset in terms of real estate? What's the difference? And I'm talking about spender. I'm talking about investor. What in the world are you talking about, Dr. Joe? And what is what differentiates the mindset between the two? So in terms of investor versus uh, the spender mindset, uh, the fundamental difference is really the perspective and the approach that uh, people have. Okay, a spender's mindset is usually uh, short term and uh, it's mainly uh, what I call consumption oriented and they focus more on immediate pleasures and uh, you know, or what they perceive as needs. It's more immediate, more short term, and so on. In contrast, an investor mindset. It's all about delayed gratification, delayed gratification and, um, you know, and more thinking more long term in terms of what long term wealth creation. OK, so one person is more short term and one uh, consumption oriented and the other person is more open to delayed gratification and thinking more long term. OK, uh, so it involves not just seeing money as a vehicle just to purchase and spend but as a tool uh, for investments and growth. You follow me? So one person perceives it as, uh, you know, as a vehicle to spend and to purchase stuff, 
items, uh, gadgets and whatever. And another person sees money as a vehicle for investment and potential growth. And so the, this mindset difference is really crucial, uh, in my opinion anyway, because uh, unless you really understand that, it's, it's, it's going to be hard. OK, so uh, I think it kind of goes into a bit of psychology here. Uh, so it's, it's going to require some kind of psychological shift, uh, you know, in terms of uh, you know, changing from a, a spender, especially if you if that's all you're used to is having a spender's mindset to change that to an investor mindset. Because, um, you know, some people, they see spending money as a as a means to happiness. OK. And uh, they see it as, uh, you know, and they see investing as risky. They see investing as something that, uh, you know, it's, it's scary and, uh, you know, and so on. So, you know, it's you're going to have to deal with habits and you're going to have to deal with uh, beliefs that some people have. And uh, and they see investing as only something that's done by the wealthy, something that's done by the other people, you know, the the other 10% or 1% or whatever they call it. And uh, so really to have an investor mindset, you've got to, certain, to a certain extent embrace risk management and you have to plan. And also you have to be in a state of what I call continuous learning. So what are the traits uh, of successful investors? Well, you know, uh, it's not it's beyond just capital. It's really having a goal-oriented focus, patience, because you're thinking long-term, and uh, and a keen eye to what I call opportunities. They're looking for opportunities. So one person can um, be in an environment and an opportunity um, you know, comes by and they just completely miss it. Uh, whereas somebody else who's tuned in uh, will see the same situation and see it as an opportunity and go for it. Okay, so that's really what's going on there. And the, you know, I, I think the investor person is more resilient. Uh, they're more uh, understanding that we go through cycles and therefore they're more likely to withstand the ups and downs of the market and not just bail out when, you know, the going gets tough. And they're more, uh, you know, trying to pursue knowledge uh, and make more informed decisions. Okay. So that's what I mean by, you know, what differentiates the investor mindset from the spender's mindset. So let's kind of just reflect here. And before we get too far, in the intricate world of real estate investing, you know, transitioning from a spender to an investor, as you can see, is not easy. And it does require that shift in mind. And, uh, but you have to kind of lay the groundwork and uh, for sustained financial success, okay? So this change is not just about dollars and cents, but it's more, more of a, a holistic transformation of our, ourselves, myself, yourself, we're ourselves, uh, in order to be able to survive and be able to utilize real estate as a vehicle towards building financial independence. So obviously we try to build a roadmap and uh, the roadmap clearly understands where you are today. Uh, you may have zero money. You may have a little bit of money. You may have a lot of money. I don't know. But, uh, it, you know, you've got to have the roadmap to get you from where you are to where you are going to. And, uh, and it's not an easy journey. It's not what these gurus always tell you. All you got to do is buy my course, go do this. It's not as simple as that, as we all know. It takes hard work. It takes effort. And it takes a plan. And that's what the investor mindset person realizes. Uh, whereas the spender, ah, it's too hard. Yeah, it's too difficult. I'm tired. I don't have time. You know, let me just go out to the bar or go out to the club or go buy some clothes, buy some jewelry and go on a vacation, you know, uh, at least I'll enjoy myself. I'll live for the day, I'll deal with tomorrow, tomorrow, okay? That's the typical spender mindset. So let's take a, an example. Uh, we got an, a person called, I'll just, for argument's sake, I'm just gonna call her Alicia, okay? So Alicia is a new investor and uh, she wants to get into real estate. Uh, but she realizes that in order to get into real estate, it's going to require her to have some savings. So she's prepared to, make some personal sacrifices in terms of uh, not you know consuming or spending all of her money, but she's uh, realized that she needs to have a budget and she's going to set aside some money, every paycheck or every pay period or from a side hustle, whatever it is, 
towards hopefully having some money set aside for a rainy day, okay? And having some money set aside to acquire some real estate, okay? So this is the cornerstone. She realized that she's gonna need some money and, uh, and she's therefore prepared to make some personal short-term sacrifices on this journey towards financial independence and buying real estate, okay? So that's Alicia. She's decided that, you know, she's gonna transition from just spending whatever she earns to set aside some money for a rainy day, set aside some money for um, you know, a down payment, set aside some money for investment purposes. That's Alicia, and she's a new investor, okay? That's what she did. So let's go to the next one. It is as follows. Uh, well, before I get to that again, we're gonna have the, um, the Q&A shortly. So please put your questions in the chat box and I'll definitely try to answer them uh, as soon as uh, I finish this sort of uh, mini presentation, which will be about another 15 minutes or so, okay? So let's talk about number three, which is embracing what I call financial consciousness. Financial consciousness. So what does that mean? It means that, you know, essentially how can a person shift? Uh, how can a shift in financial consciousness pave the way for real estate success okay how can we change our uh consciousness our mindset such that we can pave the way for real estate success we've talked about what the difference is between a spender and an investor we realize that uh you know we do require a, a change in how we uh see things how we value money how we allocate our limited monies and, uh, and so on. So why are we doing all this? How can this shift pave the way for real estate uh, success, okay? So really understanding the landscape is like laying uh, you know, the financial or the, the foundation, I suppose, uh, for a real estate portfolio. You've got to have a strong foundation. And uh, you know, one of the first things you gotta think about is analysis of your budget, okay? You've got to figure out what's coming in and what's going out and if there's a disconnect you're going to have to make some adjustments either in terms of increasing what's coming in or reducing what's going out because that way it allows you to save some money which will then allow you to hopefully start getting in the way to always acquiring some uh future investments okay so you know so again let's talk about alicia the new investor what she's going to do she's going to identify um what what she calls non-essential uh, expenses uh, that uh, hopefully she can live without. And uh, in my opinion, the big, the best way to, um, you know, to, to have some money set aside is to look at the big ticket items. And for most people, the big ticket items are your housing expenses. Are, is there a way whereby you can reduce uh, how much goes out in terms of housing? Because for a lot of people, it's 30, 40% of their income. Uh, it's just allocated to housing alone. So how can we reduce that? Because if we can reduce that, then it does allow it. It may allow us to set aside some money in for investment purposes, savings, um, you know, which we could use for down payments and uh, hopefully to acquire some, uh, 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 you know, future properties. So how are we going to uh, reduce our housing expenses? A couple of ways, depending if you're a renter or whether you're an owner. Either way, you can do what we call a house hack. Uh, a house hack is whereby if you own a house, maybe there's some space in a house whereby you can rent part of it out. Uh, it could be a spare room. It could be a basement. It could be some place in the house where somebody uh, hopefully will come in and rent that space for you. And uh, you can get some income, get some rent. And hopefully that rental income uh, will then offset part, if not all, probably part realistically, part of your um, um, debt obligations. So let's say you're a rent. So if you own a house, maybe uh, what's it called? You can rent part of it out. If you rent and you want to get onto the ownership uh, uh, train, then the other option is to buy, is to go rent something slightly bigger and then get a roommate. And uh, so again, you split the housing cost and therefore your net housing cost will be smaller. If you if you plan it right, then what it would cost if you were by renting a place by yourself. OK, so there are different ways whereby you can reduce your housing cost, whether you're an owner or whether you're a renter. But you've got to drive down that housing cost, because without that, it's very, very, very hard 
to actually save money. Most people have difficulty saving is because they just got too many monthly obligations, primarily their housing expense and other uh, loans that they've taken on. Okay, so um, so that's you know so whereas let's say uh, uh, somebody else will say okay well uh, how about let's say this person called uh, I don't know what would you call this guy uh, we'll call this person Alex so Alex is more of a, an intermediate investor so Alex is going to say okay I can reduce my housing expenses a little bit but what I want to do is to increase my income uh, as well so I'm going to start doing a house ha uh, not house I'm going to start doing a side hustle. I'm going to start doing some other activities which can help me bring in money. Okay. So there's two sides to this equation. One is to reduce your uh, expenses and the other one is to increase your income. So, you know, Alex is thinking of strategic ways uh, whereby uh, maybe leverage on uh, some of the experiences that you have, some of the technical skills that they personally have uh, in order to generate some money that way. And therefore, hopefully allow them to save money, which will be the basis for buying uh, their their next or their first investment property, okay? Whereas somebody like, uh, I don't know, next person, Mark, who's a seasoned investor, he's going to say, well, okay, how do I sort of start building this portfolio? And he's going to strategically start acquiring properties, uh, which will give him the uh, increased cash flow and also properties that will increase in value over time. So what are the action items? Uh, for, uh, you know, in order to build your financial consciousness. Uh, these are some action items I recommend. Uh, one is uh, do some budget. Look at your budget, okay? If you don't have a budget, how is, how is what's the flow of money into your personal sphere? Uh, what's coming in and what's going out? Are you able to cut down on some of the, what I, you know, unnecessary expenses? Are there things that you can do to increase income flow into your, um, you know, into your uh, circles, what I call income optimization. What are the things that you can do to increase your income flow? Uh, whether it is a side hustle, whether it be freelancing, whether it be uh, additional investments, are there things that you can do that will increase your income? Okay. Uh, then the other thing is what I call expense prioritization, which is you got to kind of prioritize uh, the money's going out. What's really, really important and what really can be sort of scaled back and uh, and set up an investment fund whereby you can, you know, the monies that you saved or the monies that's extra monies coming in, you can set that aside such that you can have that, uh, you know, in a fund, which will then hopefully allow you to purchase and acquire some future properties. So these are some of the action items, um, you know, that, uh, that you can do uh, in order to embrace financial consciousness. Again, budget. Uh, income optimization, expense prioritization, and also set up a investment fund. Okay, so hopefully that was helpful. So uh, let's go on to the next thing, which is the uh, you know the fourth part, which is uh, sort of shifting from a consumer to an investor mentality. Okay, how do we shift from a consumer to an investor mentality? And the question here is, how does transition? from a consumer to an investor mentality shape real estate success. I think I talked about that. Um, I think I know, uh, I think the action item, the question is, uh, what's it called? Uh, you know, how do we shift from a consumer and a mindset to a, uh, what's it called? Investor my uh, investor mindset. So the, the mindset, I think I've kind of talked about that a little bit. So I don't want to repeat myself too much, but essentially it's your, understanding of money it's your value of money it's how you see the importance of money what does money mean to you and um you know is it all short term is it long term can you set aside some money and uh delay uh instant or immediate gratification for a rainy day so i kind of talked about that and uh so some of the things that you want to do obviously is uh, investor education set aside some time for education and learning uh understanding market analysis understanding risk and uh, the risk and rewards, um, you know, again, really, really zero in on delayed gratification. I know when I speak to my kids, I mean, I don't know, these kids these days, they just want it now. They want it all now. I mean, they don't want to wait for tomorrow. They just, if they see something, you know, it's just, it's, it's tough. They, they have a different mindset. It's all about today. 
anyway uh but yeah that's something that we're gonna have to change uh and live for another day live for tomorrow live for next week week next year next five years next 10 years and so we can start putting the foundations together uh you know for those days so risk mitigation strategies you know what can you do to minimize risk or reduce risk um you know allocate time for market research in terms of real estate investing and also the other thing is the importance of goal setting understanding why you're doing this where you're going how you're going to get there the timeline where you're going to be a month from now six months from now a year from now five years from now and uh and so on so these are the major major uh considerations that you have to factor in you know and uh to sort of go from a consumer to an investor mentality and the number five uh point which i wanted to bring up today is really now that we've set so we what we've done so far we've decided that we're going to tr we're not a, we want to get away from just spending for the sake of spending uh we've decided that we want to have an investor mentality we want to get away from uh you know instant gratification we want to sort of start planning for a rainy day we want to start planning for our future we want to build a legacy uh, for our family um you know we want to be able to start getting some passive income we want to be able to uh, acquire and hopefully nurture and grow uh generational income and generational assets I mean, so we've decided that's what's important for us okay that's where the investor mindset comes in and we realize that real estate is the vehicle to that obviously in order to buy real estate you do need some money and therefore you've got to be able to allocate some monies uh for down payment expenses start building your portfolio uh how much you need obviously will depend on where you're located and the, the the value of the house that you're buying and so forth but we've decided that real estate is the vehicle that we want to pursue in order to get us there now we get to number five which is okay then if you want to start building this portfolio we have to do what i call strategic property acquisitions uh you can't just buy anything anywhere you gotta buy strategically okay so the question becomes uh let's have a look what's the question the question is how can a strategic approach to property acquisition uh redefine your real estate portfolio and I, i've been doing this long enough to realize that uh and i it's it's hard to explain to some people who don't get it and that is uh and i've learned the hard way uh, and and that is it's not so much what you buy uh which is important but where you buy is probably more important or just as important, um, you know, strategically. Uh, obviously, if you're just starting out, you buy where you can afford because uh, you got to get the momentum going. But I've realized that acquiring properties, uh, the location becomes very, very important, especially if you take a long term view, because not all areas appreciate the same. And, uh, and I've realized that, um, you know, the real money, in my opinion, is the appreciation. And not all houses, not all areas, not all zip codes, not all neighborhoods appreciate the same. So if you want to think long term, you may want to uh, strategically buy. And I'll give you a case in point for that. Uh, one of my tenants, I think I mentioned that last week, uh, where one of my tenants, um, she was with me for nine years and she left about a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so uh, the question was, what do I do with this house? And uh, do I sell it or do I keep it? And that was a topic last week. Um, I'm kind of leaning more towards selling it now because there's a lot of equity that's de developed. And, uh, you know, at some point you have to enjoy the fruits of your labor, as they say. Uh, but that was only possible because the value of the house went increased. It was an appreciating area. If, I was in a, uh, if that house was in an area where it didn't appreciate, then yeah i would have got possibly more cash for every month but you know we're talking a lot of money in terms of appreciation just over a, a 10 year period of time and that would not have been possible if i didn't buy it in that location if i didn't buy it in that city if i didn't buy it in that neighborhood where strategically uh i realized just based on history that there's a pretty good chance that uh prices will go up obviously nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow but uh, for, for a lot of areas, you know you're in an appreciated market because history tells us that. So, you know, um, so strategic property acquisition. Why is that important? Uh, it's really the linchpin. I think I'll just give you an example. It's really the linchpin for this thing. 
um, because, uh, you know, it, it's really important where you buy. And, uh, and therefore, you've got to develop the skills necessary to strategically purchase what you can. And uh, so, for instance, a new investor will obviously buy, start buying wherever they can afford. Uh, somebody else will say, well, I want to buy uh, to uh, get me the cash flow that I need. Another person may say, well, I want to buy for the long term because I see that uh, appreciation is possible. And strategically, uh, you can maybe buy things that meet all those criteria. It'll get you the cash flow and also get you the appreciation potential. And that's the reason why I do what I do, which is I buy properties in appreciating markets, which is hard to cash flow. But I strategically renovate the houses such that I'm more likely to at least break even, if not get more cash flow, because through Section 8, uh, the, the, the greater the number of bedrooms, the greater to the rent. So, so that's, that's sort of strategically acquiring uh, properties, not just buying anything anywhere just because uh, it's real estate. OK, so that's what I mean by that. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, if we're going to go into this uh, business, let's make sure that uh, ultimately we achieve our goals that we're striving for. And, and that's just all about strategic acquisition. It's about strategically buying uh, properties tactfully rather than just buying stuff for the sake of buying. OK, so what does that mean? Uh, so the action items for this then, I suppose, is going to be goal alignment. Um, you know, it's uh, what's it called? Uh, goal alignment. Clearly define your long term goals. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish? Market research. Take the time to uh, to understand certain markets, whether it be your neighborhood, your city, your state, your location, your zip code, or whatever. Take the time to uh, market research. Networking. Meet with uh, successful uh, investors who have uh, proven that they know what they're doing. They've proven results, and hopefully, they can um, share with you some of their lessons learned, what they've done right, what they've done wrong, and hopefully, you can avoid making uh, unnecessary mistakes. And also, doing a financial assessment. Uh, in terms of where you are, what's your financial you know, situation, uh, do a thorough financial assessment uh, before you uh, purchase each property to make sure that it's in sync with your overall goals. So that's pretty much it. Let's just wrap it up by saying the conclusion. Developing the investor mindset. Just have a 7.30. Okay, we're good. Um, you know, cult cultivating uh, an investor mindset is a process. Um, it's not something that happens overnight it's something that uh it, it takes time because uh to some people you're gonna have to break some habits um and old habits die hard as the saying goes and it's hard to change habits if you're used to spending money if you're used to you know spending money as a vehicle to to gain happiness uh you know that's that 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 that's hard to break because uh you know, it makes you feel good to spend money. And uh, if you don't spend money, you don't feel good. Or if things aren't going too well, then you go spend money just to make you feel better. It's hard to break those habits, but you have to. Otherwise, you have nothing to show for it. You have in terms of real estate. You have a lot of material goods. Uh, but in terms of solid uh, appreciating assets, it's very difficult to do that if all you're doing is spending money. So it's a process. It takes time. It starts with self-education. Uh, reading books, listening to podcasts, um, I don't know, learning from other successful investors. That's important. It also really um, starts with you having some clear financial goals uh, and really adopting a disciplined uh, financial habits, uh, such as regular savings, prudent uh, spending money, and, uh, you know, and watching where your money's going, especially the big ticket items like housing, uh, transportation uh, and things like that. If you can drive those costs down, then it allows you to save some money, which hopefully will allow you to get into the game and acquire some assets. So, but it's possible. And uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's not easy, but it's definitely possible. And I think that uh, if you want to be a successful investor, um, you know, you you have to, you know, take seriously transition from a spender mindset to an investor mindset it really it, 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 because without that it's not going to happen i know that um there are plenty of time uh you know i speak to people and it's just you know they they uh, on an outward look out, outwardly 
everything looks great. They got nice cars, they got nice clothes, they eat fancy restaurants and all that stuff. Uh, but in terms of real assets, uh, look at their financial statements, look at their net worth, there's nothing there. And uh, they may have a great salary, but at the end of the day, they really have nothing to show for it. And uh, again, I'm not criticizing anybody. It's, who, who am I to criticize? Uh, but I'm just saying that as investors, it's important that uh, you know we kind of uh, avoid instant gratification, spending money unnecessarily, and using our, our money wisely for investments and hopefully acquiring assets that will increase in value over time. So with that said, my friends, I'm pretty much done for the day. And or not the day, but done for this session. And we're going to go to the Q&A session. So if you've got some questions, please put them in the chat box. And I'll be more than happy to try to answer them. And uh, if you want to reach out to me, you can always reach me on uh, email me at joe at joeasimo.com, joe at joeasimo.com. I'll be more than happy. To, well, I'll try anyway to uh, be more uh, responsive in terms of my emails and getting back to you. Uh, so let's go down to the comments and uh, see who's here. Okay. We have Dow2. Hey, Dow2 from Phoenix. He's a regular. Hope you're doing well. And I hope you, it's not too hot down in uh, Phoenix. Well, I'm sure it's hot than where it is here in DC area. Uh, Diaspora Voices. Hope you're doing well. And uh, we got Karim uh, from New York City. How you doing, Karim? Hope all is well with you. Let's have a look. Dow2. I normally set money aside to pay taxes on the money I receive from my rental income. Good. So I just write the IRS payment when I do my tax return. Some people pay their taxes quarterly throughout the year. Okay. Let's have a look. Just carry on. And if it's not too personal a question, what's your approach to paying your taxes? <laughs> Oh, taxes, taxes, taxes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Anyway, so what do I do? Let's have a look. So I think it's got a third part of this question. It's almost the end of the year, so I have been doing tax. I suppose that tax or tax calculations. Okay. So how do I? How does Doctor Joe handle his taxes? Well, first of all, I have a CPA. I don't do my own taxes, and uh, I have a CPA that uh, focuses on um, you know um, their practice on uh, real estate investors. So they've primarily focused on real estate investors. Most of the clients are real estate investors and therefore she's more uh, or they are more in tuned with the needs of uh, uh, what's it called uh, you know investors, what's possible tax you know tax uh, uh, strategies uh, as it pertains to real estate investors. So that's number one. Number two is for my rental properties. Some properties, uh, the uh, are right, there, there's escrows uh, paid by the um, the mortgage company, so they pay. You know, so out of the monthly month, monthly mortgage that I pay, a certain portion goes to taxes and certain goes to insurance. So they pay directly. Now there are other, especially the commercial loans, where um, you know uh, they don't pay taxes. There's no money set aside for escrow, for taxes and insurance. So I'm responsible for that. So therefore, what I do is I set aside, I kind of average it out across the properties and average out how much I need to, um, you know, set aside for tax and insurance. Let me just give you an example. Then. Let's just keep it simple. Um, let's say that, uh, uh, let's say that my taxes and insurance are, Twelve hundred, twelve thousand dollars a year. About that, okay. Keep it simple. Twelve thousand dollars. I know it's not the case, but twelve thousand dollars a year, and I have ten properties. Okay, so I have ten properties, and my total, um, you know, tax and insurance that I need to pay out of pocket every year comes up to twelve thousand. So what that means is that I'm going to have to set aside twelve hundred dollars a month. Um, you know, um, you know, for taxes and insurance, because if I do that, uh, I'm sorry, a ten, a thousand dollars a month. I'm sorry, a thousand dollars a month for taxes, which means that by the end of the year, I'll have twelve thousand dollars set aside, or I will pay the taxes and insurance. Um, you know, um, you know, monthly, quarterly, whatever you want to do it. 
but I'll have sell, I, I would set aside monies uh, for taxes and insurance. Otherwise, what's going to happen is that if that money comes in from your rents and you don't set aside any monies in escrow, then you still have to pay $12,000 at the end of the year. And now you're going to be struggling because you spent all that money and you weren't disciplined to set aside some money, a little portion every month towards uh, the, the, the tax and insurance. So that's what I do. So every, every month I set aside some monies uh, specifically uh, geared towards tax and insurance. So if rents come in, I then take a certain portion out uh, and set it aside for tax and insurance in a different account. And then I would then pay the tax and insurance from that account. That's how I do it. And uh, it seems to work fine for me. And, uh, yeah, but that, that, yeah, that, that's what I do. So hopefully that answers the question now too. Uh, it's tax time. Nobody enjoys paying taxes. I certainly don't. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, you know, the cost of doing business, I suppose. If you don't, you're going to lose your house. And, um, uh, if you don't do it right and you don't have a good CPA, you could get audited. I have been audited by the IRS. It was a very ugly, well, it wasn't too bad. And uh, it was a pretty serious audit. And they actually came to my home to verify that I actually had a home office. The agent came to my house. I came, <laughs> and it was crazy. And, uh, but the CPA, I had my CPA, uh, she took care of things. And I ended up, instead of getting the owing taxes, I <laughs> crazy story about this. I ended up getting a refund from the IRS after the audit. How about that? So it does help to have a good uh, CPA. And uh, if you're interested in who I use, then, you know, just shoot me an email. I'll be more than happy to share you that information. Uh, okay, keep going. Karim, uh, I'm in New York City and I'm mainly coming across multifamilies that are in my budget, which I can rent out to Section 8. What are your thoughts about that? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's fine. I mean, uh, I'm not too familiar with the New York City market. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm all for uh, Section 8. And, uh, but there's a caveat to that. And the caveat is that you do your screening. Uh, because like all people, all groups, there are the good, the bad, and the ugly. And one thing I've learned is that if you are not careful and you get the, the bad and the ugly, uh, you won't survive very long. Uh, they'll drive you crazy and uh and so on so what that's that's irrespective of whether you are section eight or not tenants so what i do i tell people to uh take time to learn how to screen well uh take time to uh educate yourself on what strategies you need to implement such that you have happy tenants tenants who like your property once they're in you manage that relationship and hopefully they'll keep renew their leases and then hopefully you'll have reduced turnover because if you can't control that turnover cost, it's very, very difficult, very, very tough. So, yeah, I'm all for Section 8. Uh, you may want to contact your local housing authority and uh, to learn more about uh, the Section 8 uh, program where you're located, uh, Karim, and uh, try to develop some relationships, see if you can go out there and meet some people, explain, or maybe join an association, landlord association, so you can... Um, hear from other landlords, their experiences in your locality. They may be able to give you some recommendations of, of staff members. You, you know, they, I mean, you know, there are people out there who have relationships that you may be able to uh, leverage because, uh, you know, the Section 8 program, like all the other programs, it's a government program, so it's a bureaucracy. So your success in, you know, navigating that bureaucracy to a certain extent um, is dependent on the relationship that you have. So the more relationships you have, uh the better it is for you also i did some research and saw that if the voucher allows five to six beds it's usually for nine to ten people you usually have five beds so isn't that too many people uh i have houses as opposed to apartments and uh you know in the dc area there's a lot of um i won't say a lot but there are enough five and six bedroom voucher holders um you know to sustain a business which means that there just aren't a lot of five to six bedroom houses out here you know and most of the houses uh you know in dc at least dc they tend to be more three bedrooms and uh so if you have a five or six bedroom voucher 
it, you, there's just not a lot of supply of uh, houses. So yes, there's a reduced number of people that have five or six bedroom uh, uh, vouchers, but there's also a reduced number of five available five to six bedroom units. So it kind of uh, matches each other up. And uh, so, you know, in terms of the number of people, it varies. Uh, we just did a moved in a family with a six bedroom voucher. She moved in there uh, November the 1st. So in that household, they have eight children and there's eight children, two adults, uh, a couple, and uh, they have a, a six bedroom voucher. So, you know, yes, it's uh, eight people and no, 10 people. So, and, uh, but they have a six bedroom voucher. They had a hard time finding a good one. And mine came up. They liked it. I liked them. And we decided to execute the lease together and um, and so on. So I, I can't say that everywhere, Karim. You're going to have to call your housing authority and find out from them which group of people uh, have the hardest time finding housing uh, and then try to, uh, you know, uh, provide housing for those people because, you know, they're having a hard time which means that there's uh, there's not a lot of supply, but there's demand. Okay, that's how I did it anyway. Uh, okay, let's have a look. Uh, can you run through one of your recent projects and numbers? What type of screening questions did you ask them? Okay, so let's, okay, I'll just, okay, let me go through the one we just did a couple of weeks ago then. The one that just moved in, the family that just moved in uh, November the 1st. So uh, it's a six bedroom house. In fact, I did a, uh, a, uh, a session there, uh, an event there a few weeks ago. Uh, definitely want to come to my next event whenever I do that one. Anyway, so uh, it's a six bedroom house. When I originally bought it, it was a three bedroom. So we added three extra bedrooms, uh, two in the basement. We were able to create another bedroom in the attic. So, uh, so it makes it six bedrooms. And uh, I put it up for uh, on Zillow and a couple of other websites uh, when it was ready. And uh, I got quite a few. I ended up uh, doing some uh, open houses and, uh, you know, ended up with 10 applications, 10 applications. Uh, these are people who took the time to fill the application and pay their application fee. So there was definitely a lot of demand for that property. Uh, how did I screen the tenants or prospective tenants? Um, I uh, have an eight-page rental application. A lot of questions, who they are, uh, current landlord, previous landlords, where they live, where they work, and uh, what are they looking for and so on. So uh, I, said, for, I went through the application once they completed it just to make sure that uh, every, the application is complete. And uh, so I then contacted the current landlords and also contacted the previous landlords where they lived uh, to get some rental verifications. I, saw, I, I asked a lot of pointed questions to the landlords to gauge their experiences uh, with the tenant. Uh, again, the current landlord and the previous landlord, uh, I do that because uh, the current landlord may have a hidden agenda. They may want to get rid of this person. So uh, they may say great things just to get them out of their house. So the previous landlord usually is a bit more honest and can kind of give you the real deal. Um, you know, so I ask a lot of questions about their rental history, uh, where they pay the rent on time, kept the place up, and uh, they're in trouble, you take them to court and so forth. Uh, if they're working, I contact the employment uh, just to make sure they work in there. But it really is not that important for voucher holders because uh, uh, DCHA, or not DCHA, the Housing Authority uh, does that. Uh, because they're the housing authority, they're the ones who determine the rent and how much of the rent the tenant pays and how much of the rent does the um, uh, the housing authority pay. Uh, then I'll do a social media search. I do a background search and uh, find out more about their history. And, um, you know, I do a credit, a credit search as well. And, uh, you know, then I'll, if everything looks good, then I'll do a home visit and uh see how they keep their current place and uh see if they uh you know 
uh, how they keep the house because how their house is today is how my house is going to be in three months. So that's what I did for this family. And uh, plus a couple of other families who went through the shortlist. And then ultimately, uh, I selected this family and then they moved in. So that's the uh, that's the process I went through. And, uh, you know, I ask, I ask a lot of questions and I just shared with you uh, some of those questions. But uh, obviously, we don't have enough time to go with. That's a whole nother session. In fact, I may do a uh an event just focused on um uh you know, how to attract and retain what i call tier one tenants uh, but i do have a uh some materials out here leases rental applications and all that other stuff it's for sale uh just go to my website go to the store you can buy it from there uh hopefully that was helpful uh Krim. do you have a criteria that you look for when you shop for a house uh, yes, I need bedrooms. I need uh, four, five, six bedrooms. Therefore, uh, what's important to me is, can I get four, five, six bedrooms? Uh, if I can, then I'm buying it. If I can't, I'm not buying it. And uh, the neighborhood, the location is very important um, because tier one tenants tend to, you know, they tend to look for certain things. And uh, you don't have to be the best neighborhood because uh, every area you go, people live there. So there are tier one neighborhoods, sorry, there are tier one tenants in A, B, C, D, E neighborhoods. So it's not so much the neighborhood per se, it's the tier one tenant. That's what I'm trying to, uh, these are the, what I mean by tier one are people are going to pay their rent, take care of the property, pleasant to deal with, and hopefully looking for a place to stay for a long time. So that's what I call a tier one tenant, and that's who I'm trying to appeal to. Um, but in terms of the houses, location is very important. Uh, can I add extra bedrooms? Is it close to shopping, recreation, transportation, rec you know, all those things? Why? Because uh, my tier one tenants have told me that's what they're looking for. And they are looking for a good landlord, a landlord that's going to be pleasant and do the right thing. So that's what I look for when I look for a house and what I look for when I look for a tenant. Okay, Dow 2. Uh, I was audited once too. My experience is to pay the amount they say you owe immediately and fight it afterwards and get your money back because they consistently add interest and late fees. That's true. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure about uh, pay and fight. Uh, you know, I would suggest that uh, if you get a notice, then you may want to contact your uh, CPA and bring it to their attention. And uh, they will guide you, advise you as to what, you know, should you pay it or should you fight it? And hopefully they'll do the lead on that. Okay. Got some good questions today. 750. Got 10 more minutes. Uh wow, you're thinking about selling. Selling may be a good future streaming topic. I have never sold any of my rentals. Uh yes, uh, as I said, I I we talked about that last week. Uh when's the right time to buy, hold, and sell? And this particular property, uh, I've owned it for you know almost uh, a dozen years. Uh, or 10 years really and um, it's appreciated quite a bit uh, and so you know hey um, I need to enjoy the labors of my fruits of my labor as they say at some point uh, so why not now so I'm going to I'm thinking of selling this one I have a hundred I mean the, my contracts is on do some upgrades right now and uh, I'll make that decision uh, very very shortly but I'm kind of leaning that way uh and so on so yes I, I don't normally sell my houses uh but you know every now and then I'm, I'm at the point now where i every time a tenant leaves i ask that question is this one a holder is this a seller um you know uh, what's the exit strategy okay get lobster are there ways to minimize closing costs for an investment property just got pre-approved for our first rental and was told closing costs will be around 10k, which we forgot to think about. Okay, so are there are there ways to minimize closing costs? Um, yes, I suppose so. On an investment property, I suppose you can see if you can get the seller to pay your closing costs. That's one way. Um, you know, the other way would be to maybe pay a little bit more, and therefore you get some money back. So, for example, if the house is a hundred thousand, and you agree. With to buy it for a hundred thousand, you may agree with the tenant. Okay, uh, I'll write a contract for one hundred and ten, and then uh, on the HUD one, 
they'll reimburse you uh, 10,000. So that way you get $10,000 back. And, uh, you know, obviously it means that uh, the house has got to appraise for 110 and uh, it's got to be on the HUD one. So, you know, everything is above board and um, and so on. So there's different ways to do that one. That's another strategy. Uh, the seller may just take back a note and uh, and therefore, you know, you don't have to pay so much. Therefore, you can save some of that money. And that money that you save could then be used for um, closing costs. Uh, what are the ways? Um, I mean, these are ones that come right at the top of my head. And uh, but I'm sure there are other ones. If you've got some other ideas, please uh, let me know. But you could borrow the money from other people. Um, because if you don't have it and you need it, then uh, either you're going to have to save it or get it from somewhere somewhere uh otherwise the the deal's not going to close so if it's a good deal i'll figure a way to get the money and um you know if i have to borrow then so be it okay i'll reach out to the housing authority all your information are great and really wanted to thank you for this i had a completely different mindset about section eight you have any courses details please uh, yeah, I, I'm going to be doing a Section 8 course probably in the near future. So please keep in uh, keep, keep keep tabs. And uh, I definitely will uh, try to uh, bring it to your, your attention when I when I go when I uh, offer that class again. Uh, OK, wealth and wellness with grace. Thanks, Dr. Joe. Thank you. Wealth and wellness with grace thank you grace hope you're doing well i'm not sure where you're from grace but uh uh I don't know if you're on the east coast west coast midwest or wherever anyway wherever you are wealth and wellness hope you're doing well and get a lot get launched there again uh thank you so much okay great thank you very much okay i think uh, i am done for the day uh i want to get some rest i'm tired and i had a long workout this morning i try to exercise every day i woke up extra early today about 4.30 I woke up, so it's been a long day, and uh, I'm going to get some rest and uh, go for another workout tomorrow morning. So with that said and done, my friends, I wish you a wonderful evening, and I'll see you next week. So take care. Bye for now.